welcome to the Lotco Business Podcast, a show all about helping you as a retailer, brand, or creative understand the actual business side of running your business. I offer straightforward, practical advice about the nitty gritty of making money from your creative passion. We will be covering bite-sized business and marketing lessons, as well as interviews with experts and trailblazers in the fashion, homewares, and design industries. My name is Melissa Robbins. I'm a business coach, color-loving, non-coffee-drinking Melbourneian. Let's get into it. Hello, and welcome to today's episode. I am going to bring you today 10 steps you need to take to make sure that you're trade show ready and that you have maximum success at your trade show. Now, I do do a few webinars on this and I talk about this a lot. Um, The reason I do is because I have been to over 60 trade shows in my time, whether that has um, been as, as an exhibitor, I've been as a buyer, I've been as an education and consultant, and I go now to many, many trade shows every year all around the world. And one of the things that I see is you can tell sometimes when people are not ready, but when they aren't maximizing the investment that they're making. And so these are just 10 tips that I see and that I've picked up on over time that I think you need to be trade show ready. All right, so let's go. Number one is to plan, plan, plan. Now we want to know, I want you to plan exactly what your stand should look like. I want you to map it out. I want you to draw it out, actually physically map out the space, whether it's in your home office, your warehouse, um, your bedroom, whatever it takes, map out the space, draw it out, actually put the pieces of furniture in, actually lay out, you know, where people are walking through, what's the flow through feel like, is there enough space if there's more than one person on the stand, where are you going to put your bag, where are you going to put your things when you get there at the start of the day, what visually is someone going to see when they first walk up, what are they going to look like when they come from the left-hand angle or the right-hand angle, All of these things need to be considered because a trade show is very different to a market as well. Lots of people have done boutique markets and think that they're the same thing, but they're not because we really want people to come onto our stand at a trade show. We want to encourage that um, people to actually touch and feel and enter the stand as opposed to at a market. Most of the time, you've got things right at the front. So we want to encourage people to come in. How are you going to do that? How are you going to attract someone from far away as well if they're going to catch their eye, you know, further away? Are you going to have the product in the right location on your shelf? You don't need to have malt bulk bulk products there because you have you're only selling off you know the actual samples you don't need to have lots of volume of product there although volume can look really cool too so how are you going to do that mapping out and planning your space is super important until you do this you don't really get that understanding of scale so make it accessible for people make it accessible for eye level and for touching don't put things too low because no one's going to bend down to grab them I can promise you that Um, So remove those barriers for buyers to come in and encourage them to sort of touch and feel things on your stand as well. So have some things on the front and on the sides as well as at the back, but make it open for them to actually enter as well. All right. So every angle is critical. Number two, be prepared in terms of what special items you need. Do you need to order your wallpaper? Do you need to order the paint if you're going to do that beforehand? Do you need to have a neon sign ready? I've done all of these things badly before, which is the reason I'm talking to you about them now. Um, you know, didn't paint until the day before, which most shows don't actually let you do that anymore. Um, didn't, you know, the neon sign was stressing and rushing to get it ready, having it in time, all these things. So um, not having the like carry bag that I wanted. I've got a, had a cool giveaway bag for people to take away with them, a tote bag, but not ordering ahead of time. Do you need special furniture, shelving, whatever it is. So making sure that you're prepared and have things ready prior so that you're on the you know days before the show you're just waiting for it to actually start you've got everything ready you're packed you're organized and you can't wait to get there all right number three product Ooh, again done this before where I haven't had my product ready and so it's been stressful the day of the show or days before or like an hour before not having all the samples ready available from china which was a complete nightmare but they ended up turning up but we didn't have the mind, didn't have them pressed, all that sort of stuff. So make sure you have your product ready, not just that it looks good, but it's got the pricing on it. It's got the right swing tag on it if necessary. Make sure you have pricing on everything. It doesn't have to be big and bulky. It doesn't have to be like hit you in the face, but having a price on the product is really important. And if you're going to have, I suggest having both prices, wholesale and retail, because then the customer knows, the buyer knows what the margin is in there as well. 
and they can see immediately without having to think, is this retail price right for my customer? Is this price point right? Um, Having both allows you to see that. Having just one, if you do just have one, if you only want to have one price, you should have wholesale because that's what people are buying there. They're having wholesale. But make sure it's specified this is, you know, WS, wholesale price. Does it include tax or not? Depends if you, you know, do that in your where you are. So making sure your samples are ready, they look good, they have the right information on them, they've got the right skew or colour code if that's needed. Um, make, don't make it hard for buyers. Don't make people have to ask because they won't. And you might not always be available to talk to people because you're talking to someone else, you're with another buyer, maybe you've gone off to the bathroom. So having prices on everything, having it available without having them to, without anyone having to ask is really important. All right. Number four is the stand. Like, what does your stand in your display look like? So have you really considered that VM? Um, it's such an important part to get attention because you want to get people to your stand in the first place. So how are you attracting people from further away? What's standing out? How obvious is your brand name? If you know, you know people want to come and visit you but they can't find you, how obvious do you make it? What can you do to stand out? It doesn't have to always be like your branded colors. Like maybe you're going to have a different wallpaper than what you normally would because it really makes it pop. What flowers are you going to have? What display, you know, visuals are you going to have? How having layers can be great to really stack up and using those rules of VM, like, you know, rules of odd numbers, threes or triangles or height. How can you use that in your display to really attract the attention of your buyers as well so that they're encouraged to buy and they can also see how it looks on their shelf, how it's going to make their store look amazing because of how great your display looks. Consider your packaging, consider how um, it's going to sit in their store, even showcase multiple ways that it can be displayed. Is that part of what your product is that it can be shown like that? Don't leave it to the last minute, ideally. Have a plan, and this comes back to number one and prepping your space. So understanding what you need to get beforehand and giving yourself enough time. So often trade shows will have a two- to three-day bump in. So maybe setting up on that first day, and so the second day gives you that chance to get extra flowers if needed or a you know, new mat rug if needed and stuff like that. So having that display in VM, thought out, considered, and attracting attention and visually looking amazing so people are like I need this in my shop I need I need it to sit like that on the shelf and I want it to pop number five is invitations so inviting people to come to your stand letting people know that you're going to be there do you prior to the show send out invitations to new buyers targeting new buyers letting them know that they can make an appointment or you're going to be at this particular stand at this particular show in this you know time frame are you upstairs are you downstairs Do you have it on your signature, on your email? Do you do behind the scenes posts on your Instagram, your social beforehand, telling people that you're going to be there, so prepping people that you're going to be there? Do you want to send a little press kit, a little gift box to special buyers before the show to say, hey, this is what we're going to be at. Love to you to come and see us here. I know that you attend these shows, if you know that information, (laughs) Um, and get them to come and encourage people to come to you. Certain trade shows, certain countries and regions are different, but I know from experience in Australia, a lot of buyers will walk the whole show, they'll go around the whole show. In the US, often they'll go to particular buyers, particular stands, and they won't look at the whole show. So unless you've got a invitation, you've invited them or they've got an invitation to come and see you, they might not even know that you're there. So how can you encourage that? Or what sort of press or things can you do prior to get people to know about you before the show? Don't just rely on the show's traffic to get people to you. So invite people beforehand, target particular stores, gives that brand awareness for you as well. So people are like, oh yeah, I've, I've seen their, you know, I got a postcard from them or, you know, I've seen an email from these guys or I've seen something on Instagram about this, this brand. I can't wait to go and see it. All those things can help. Hello, lovely. If you're looking for a way to grow your product business without relying on Facebook ads or posting daily on social media, then I invite you to register for my free masterclass. This is happening very, very soon, and inside of this masterclass, I'm sharing the strategy behind building a profitable product-based business so you can attract consistent customers and scale to six figures and beyond. I also emphasize how to create a sustainable long-term business, which is such an important factor for me. I'm so excited to be teaching this masterclass soon, so make sure you go and register for your free spot by heading to the link in the show notes below. All right. Number six is marketing material. 
So order forms, catalogs, postcards, physical catalogs, super important to have. You should definitely have material so that people can physically take with them. Personally, I love a little tote bag. I love a little gift giveaway. Certain things can work really well to sort of get attention from other people. If they're walking the show and they see someone with your gift bag, that can honestly can be like a magpie. You know, people like, what is this shiny thing that I want something of as well? I need to go to that stand. Um, You buyers like to, not everyone does, um, but lots of buyers like to take something with them and then they look at that that night in their hotel room and look at all the different things that they've picked up and think, yeah, that could be really great. So the stronger your visuals in your on your postcard or your your catalog are, the more likely they are to keep that and maybe use it either whether they buy at the show or they buy it, you know, two weeks after the show or maybe six months after the show because they've kept your catalog. What is your marketing material that you've got? Make sure it's ready. Make sure you've actually got something visually appealing and showcases your best self. Sometimes you might have a couple of different postcards of the different categories you have. If you sell children's, have something for that. If you sell women's, have something for that. If you sell, you know, a different category, have a different postcard for that. You might have one catalog, but then you might have different things to visually showcase who you are on the other things. Make sure it's got your contact information on there, a little bit about your brand, QR codes potentially for people to scan, you know, the digital the digital catalogue afterwards too can be really helpful. Um, but definitely have something for people to take with them. Don't assume they all just want a digital link because they're sick of digital. People are sick of buying digital. That's why they're going to the show to get that physical experience. So give them something physical to take with them and use. Now, a question that comes up, how many do I need to have? Like, Seriously, it's it's hard to know, hard to say. Have more of your um, postcards that you can give away freely. So you might have 200 of those. And, you know, hopefully you can use them afterwards in another way. Catalogs, I always suggest at least 100. Depends on how big they are, how much you've invested in spending on getting them created. But remember, lifetime value of your customer. These customers could be worth 10, 20 grand for you or 100 grand for you in over time. So is it worth spending five bucks on a catalog? It is. Really? It is. Okay. I'm telling you now. It definitely is. All right. So have that marketing material ready and with enough time to get it printed beforehand. Also include things like your terms and conditions, your minimum order quantity, your contact details, how to order, give people specifics, how to order and tell them what to do next. Number seven, sales staff. Are you the best person for this role? If not, have someone come along with you. Maybe your bestie is. Maybe you've got a your, your you know social media person who works in your with you. Get them to come with you. Who is the best person to be doing this? It's sometimes not you, but it is okay if it's you. But if it is you and you're not comfortable, start practicing. Figure out you know what are the things you're going to say to people. Have conversation starters. You've got this sort of like ideas of you know what to talk to people about. Remember that these buyers are going to a lot of stands. They don't want to have the same conversation with every person. So come up with different ways to connect to people that aren't just about your product or about you know their store, but talk to them as a person, as a human, and connect with them in a different level, in a different way. Talk to them about you know not not the weather because again that's probably not something that you want to hear about, and don't talk to them about how tired you are and how sore your legs are because they work in retail, they do not want to hear it. This is their bread and butter. This is what they do every day. So please don't say that to them. All right. So sales staff, having the best person for the role, maybe someone else is going to spruik and talk about your product better than what you can. I used to work for uh, my friend on her stand because I would be able to talk about the product in a way that she never could because she was not as, you know, talking about how good she was or how good the product was because people are humble. That's just not actually what you do. So have a little think about, are you the best person for the role? Can you get someone else to help you there if you're not? Or if it's just you, how can you practice, you know, what to say, what to talk about beforehand and get some idea or talk to other people about what is a good approach or what is a good conversation starter on the stand as well when people come up to you. Number eight is data collection. Make sure that you keep data. How do you track it? These days, there's so many apps and things you can get to scan information. I still think old school, um, writing down some notes, having a notebook, you know, keeping, because you'll never remember. I promise you, it's like having kids and you think you remember when they first, when they first walked or they first did this, you you won't remember. Um, well, personally, I don't remember. (laughs) Um, so keeping track of it, writing it down, having a little notebook that says, you know, Sarah from so-and-so store loved these colors, loved this sort of category, you know 
she was there um, visiting for two days because she had to rush back or whatever it is. Having some notes on people, keeping details about people, so then that's a way to connect back with people later. So tracking your data, tracking your leads. Often trade shows are about leads as well that you generate, not just the sales on the day. So sometimes those leads might take, you know, two, three trade shows before they actually buy from you or two, three points of contact before they buy from you. So keeping track of those people and what they liked and how they, you know, can, what they think about your brand or what they think about particular things can be really important for that follow up later on. All right. So make sure you do follow up as well. Minimum number nine, we're up to number nine, minimum order quantities and deposits. Now, this is a bit of a bugbear with me. I don't personally like deposits because I think as a retail buyer, when I was a buyer, I didn't want to give money out to someone I didn't know, first of all. I didn't know when the stock was going to come, if it was actually going to come. Cash flow is always tight for retail. So if I'm going to spend money on something, I want the actual product so then I can sell it. So deposits are a bit of a um, tough one for people to expect their retailers to spend money on. It's almost for me personally as the buyer, I think that the uh, the maker, the the brand should be you know, supporting their own business. That's their deal, how they're going to pay for their stock, how they're going to pay for the production. That's nothing to do with me. I can just buy the product and I want the product when it's available. So this is one of those things that being on both sides of it, I can totally see both points of view because the brands, you know, want that security to know that they're going to get that order and if they're going to produce a stock for that person. Um, but the buyers don't necessarily want to pay money for, you know, too far in advance. So I think it's got to be about how far in advance that you are going to be able to, you know, deliver that product or how long you're going to hold that deposit for, how much you're asking for, and, you know, what expectations the buyers have and if they know you or not. So, and also maybe it comes back to your past experience, you've been burnt, so then you want to deposit. So I think about negotiating that and figuring out what works for your stores or the brands. But personally, I think that the brand needs to manage their own cash flow and their own business, same way the retailer does. So you can't expect your retailers to pay that deposit for you. But I understand some people need to, especially if it's a special order item or you've got a, you know, it's a large um, uh, price point item too, like special customized jewelry and stuff like that. It's understandable. It just depends on that time frame between when the order's actually, when you take that deposit and when the order's delivered. The shorter that is, the better, but obviously the shorter that is, then you might just get the full payment. If you want full payment, I think you need to deliver within two to three weeks max. If you're asking for a deposit, I think you've only, you can only ask if it's sort of due in three months or if it's a special order. If it's an indent order, I really believe that you can't ask for a deposit, but I know some people want to. That's just my point of view. So have a little think about that. Definitely have a minimum order. Don't go in and go, well, it doesn't matter. You can just buy, you know, small quantities or pick and choose. Buyers want to know what they need to order and it doesn't hurt to have an order because it sort of shows that you're strong and you're, you know, got convictions about how much you're worth as well to have that minimum order. It doesn't have to be high and it can be flexible. Some start off at 150, 200 if you've got something like, you know, a small price point item. And then you can get into the store and they hopefully get reorders anyway. Other people are like, I think $300 is a totally normal minimum order deposit and it's not a big amount. If people can't spend that on your product, and again, depends on the price point, but, you know, they're not willing to spend $300 to get a new brand in. They're not really willing to test things out. $300 is an okay amount. It, the more higher your price point, though, you might be a thousand, two thousand, five thousand dollars. Depends on how much in demand you are, too. But definitely, don't be afraid to have a minimum order um, for your, you know, to buy wholesale because they're getting that discount for wholesale. They should. They're expecting to pay minimum order. Some people also expect to buy in packs or minimum order quantity per style. That is okay as well. So go ahead and have a minimum order. Um, consider whether you have a deposit or not as well. All right, number 10 is, are you ready? Physically ready, mentally ready, prepared? You know, like it's a three to four day event with bump in, bump out. It can be exhausting. Make sure that you're physically ready. You're prepped yourself. You've got everything planned prior. Um, You've got staff to help you if you need it. You've got snacks to take along with you if you can't get to the the show. You've got the right shoes to wear. You carry your water with you. 
Um, all of these things, think about how comfortable you're going to be, what you're going to do, what you're going to do when it is quieter times. Like it's okay to be doing some work in the quieter times as long as you're still focusing on if people are coming to you and you're not just, you know, head down on your computer and you're not doing anything else. It's also an opportunity to meet with other people and engage and network and connect and stuff like that too. So how can you do that too? Maybe even planning to have, you know, a friend or a partner come along or a staff member to come along so that you can go to some education sessions um, or so that you can go and have, you know, a check out at all the other stands that are at the show and interact with people. So planning those things, getting ready for those things, um, thinking about, you know, what you're going to be doing on the actual day of the show. Have you physically got yourself ready? prepped and organized. Make sure that you know what time you have to get there, how you're going to park, all those things, because they'll stress you out beforehand if you haven't thought about them. Personally, um, yeah, making sure that you know exactly the time of the start date and, sorry, the start time and end time each day. Sometimes the shows have VIP, you know, people can come in early and they haven't actually told you about it or you're not quite, it's not advertised, but it actually is something that you need to be there as an exhibitor. So have a little think about that. All right, 10 things to get your whole a trade show ready. Let's just go through briefly again what they are. So we've got number one, plan, 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 get ready. Number two is be prepared. Number three is have your product ready. Number four is make sure your stand and VM and, and the display has looking schmick and looking fancy and going to grab attention. Number five is to send out some invitations prior, whether physical or email as well. Um, number six is to make sure you have good marketing material, physical, something for people to take. Number seven, sales staff. Who is it? Are you the right person? Who else can help you? Number eight is data collection. How are you going to track and keep notes or, um, you know, have a little notebook for keeping information? Number nine is minimum orders and deposits. What are you going to do there? What does yours look like? And number 10 is, are you ready? Physically, mentally prepped and ready and organized. So make sure you have fun. Make sure that, you know, engage and network and talk to other people. Not every store is right for you. Not every person is right for you. Don't be worried if people walk on by. Don't be stressed if you don't get the orders on the day. It's not all about the orders in those days. It's about that lifetime value of people as well. You might pick up four stores, but they might be your best four stores and stay with you for 10 years. So don't value it just on the day of the sales sales of the days, that all makes sense. Um, Think about it as a long-term prospect and how this is going to be a starting point for building that momentum for your wholesale and building that revenue stream in your business. So I hope that helps. 10 things to get your trade show ready, trade show prepped. Um, I look forward to seeing lots of people at the new trade shows coming up in the next few months. And yeah, if you need help with trade shows too, I love working with people on helping them get that trade show ready, having, making sure you're ready for your international trade shows. I've done lots of international trade shows and I help people get ready for those as well. It is something I'm passionate about and excited about and love getting you ready and prepped so that you maximize that investment of your trade show because they're not cheap and they do take a lot of energy and time, but they can be so worthwhile and they can be such a great place to get in front of buyers and have buyers who are ready and um, open to um, buying at the show as well. All right. So I hope that helps. I look forward to sharing more with you soon and I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you so much for listening to the Lotco Business Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure you subscribe to receive future episodes as they are released. And I'd be so, so grateful for a review on Apple Podcast. If you would like a copy of the show notes or any of the links mentioned today, please jump onto my website at thelotco.com.au forward slash podcast. Have an amazing week and I look forward to chatting to you again soon.